Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, the MSP. This is US election extra, giving you the update for the Harris-Trump showdown and what is going on. So we're going to start with some positives for the Harris campaign. We're going to look at reactions to the Harris bump, if you like, from Republicans and how much of a challenge that will be and what, what direction they might take. Uh, we're also going to be discussing Gaza and Harris's position on Gaza, which I think is absolutely fascinating, and indeed unions. So some interesting positioning there. So quite a bit to talk about, but it won't be a particularly long one today. OK, we're going to start with Obama endorsing Harris as the Democratic nominee for US president. We knew this was coming. We're just waiting on the time. He's now the last piece of the jigsaw in endorsement. The coalescing, the quick coalescing around Harris has been absolutely amazing no one was expecting such unity from the democratic party there's no chaos there's just no chaos and this is exactly what you want to platform uh, uh to give a solid platform for harris and for any democratic uh nominee to uh, do as well as they possibly can against trump uh, pr former president had conspicuously withheld his endorsement in the immediate aftermath of biden's decision to withdraw um, and it's now come after Harris earned the backing of Bill and Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, and most of the state governors and most senior de Democrats in Congress, as well as Biden himself. Obama had added his voice, has added his voice to what amounts to a major boost for the vice president. I was talking to you about how you keep the wave going. So this is just you add little bits on to keep that momentum. You don't want it to be too peaky and trophy. You want there to be this positive tidal wave of support for Harris that, that continues to self-perpetuate throughout the, the 100 days. The problem is that's an awful long time to sustain such positivity. And you are going to have the Republicans trying to stop that momentum, right? And so how do you uh, overcome? How do you mitigate against the Republican attacks that are definitely going to come? So anyway, the sort of thing you do is you turn everything into chunks of uh, viral content, stuff that can be easily shared. Barack and Michelle Obama endorse Kamala Harris for, for president. And that then becomes a 52 second video in and of itself. together. Oh, it's good to hear you both. I, I, I can't have this phone call without saying to my girl Kamala, I am proud of you. This is going to be historic. We called to say Michelle and I couldn't be prouder to endorse you and to do everything we can to get you through this election and, and into the Oval Office. Oh my goodness. Michelle, Barack, this means so much to me. I am looking forward to doing this with the two of you, Doug and I both and um, getting out there, being on the road. But most of all, I just want to tell you the, the words you have spoken and the friendship that you have given over all these years mean more than I can express. So thank you both. It means so much. And, um, and we're going to have some fun with this too, aren't we? Kamala. So there you go. So something that can be uh, shared easily, that her reaction, and also trying to overcome the idea that there is any kind of division that might have had led to a late endorsement from Obama. So that's that. That's good. You know, the Democratic Party is going to like that. It's all, you know, happy, happy days for them. No one else, no one is being difficult. No one's being an ob obstacle on the Democratic front uh, for uh, Kamala Harris. Okay, so good stuff there. Right. Trump's campaign headquarters has declined to debate Harris before she's officially nominated, according to The Hill. According to Stephen Chang, a spokesman for the former president, the details of the campaign debate cannot be finalised until the Democrats officially decide on their nominee. So that's to say that it's not going to take place until sort of late August onwards, uh, which is exactly the right time frame anyway. September, October, before the November elections, that's when you're going to have your debates. So it's not going to happen like next week. Uh, and and that's absolutely expected. Uh, Kamala Harris has said she's up for it. Bring it on. Were well, her words, bring it on. Um, right. So now we're going to look at some interesting positioning on uh, some big policy ideas. First one is going to be unions. Second one's going to be Gaza. Uh, so let's go to unions. Now, I... I 
I'm playing you this because she did a speech yesterday and it was a really very good speech. So her stump speeches at the moment are actually very strong. And I said that there were some worries about whether she'll be able to deliver teleprompter speeches. Absolutely no problem. She's killing them. You're really doing a very good job. This was an excellent speech and it combines some of the things you've heard before with things that were relevant for speaking to a teacher's union, right? And talking to the future of the country and, you know, teaching children being, setting up the future of the country, et cetera, et cetera. The AFT, which is the um, the teachers' union, was the first union to endorse Harris. So she went and spoke to teachers, get those teachers on side, and get the union on side, and also try and reconnect with the union workers across the states. You had the Teamster leader, the big union guy, speak at the RNC, uh, although he did kind of go a bit off piece and talk about loads of really big union things, which wouldn't have landed very well with the RNC. But what you need the Demo what the Democrats need to do to to win is to get union those working class voters that have fled and gone to Trump. You need them back. You need unions to endorse uh, Harris and the Democrats. And you have had this this tussle between the, with with the unions as to how they how they treat the election with regard to many of their members being sort of working class guys um, who who may be, you know, not your elite, basically, they're not your urban elites, who feel just naturally more aligned to not necessarily Donald Trump's policies, because I don't think it, it's about policies with Trump. It's about the kind of guy Trump is, making a, a statements about immigration consistently and, you know, being bombastic and just just appealing to that kind of person. And so the Democrats have to fight to get those union workers back. And are, at the end of the day, they are the party between the two parties. They are the party that is most going to benefit union workers with defending workers' rights and, um, you know, not being as as corporate, as, uh, as pro-corporation as, say, the, the Republicans. Um, so it's interesting that she's going down this route because... The flip side is that that this is potentially one of those divisive issues, a bit like kind of Israel Gaza, where you've got to play it carefully. Because you go all in pro-union, you're going to lose your corporate backers, you're going to start like annoying that you're more well-off people up here who like to take advantage of their workers, right? And so hopefully you, you, this is the correct way to go for, for the right moral economic reasons, but but there will be some backlash potentially. No, we will move forward. And one of the best ways to keep our nation moving forward is to give workers a voice, to protect the freedom to organize, to defend the freedom to collectively bargain, to end union busting. As head of the White House Labor Task Force, I have led our work to eliminate barriers to organizing in both public and private sectors, including for teachers. But there is more. So I, I'll be stopping these kind of videos just to analyze what's going on. So what, what she's doing is she's saying, I've already been the person who has been pro-union for you. And here are my, here are my receipts, right? And I'm going to take this on and improve you a lot for you guys. What she wants is unions to, to be under no illusion that the Democrats are the party for them. And she's, she's trying to basically tick all of these boxes in a way that I don't think Donald Trump really does. And again, it's going to sound just like a brute criticism of Trump. But, and it kind of is because actually I don't think he's very good strategically. He gets by on very minimal strategizing Trump. He gets by on himself as a as a this cult of personality where people flock to him rather than to what he's saying about things that are relevant for them he'll do some kind of big ticket ideas like roe v wade and immigration but essentially it's kind of vacuous whereas harris is is trying to get people excited by her youth by being a woman of color etc etc yeah and ticking boxes in in those regards but then going through the the policy tick boxes so you can expect her to speak strongly on uh invite the environment right get those people on board you're going to expect her to speak strongly on unions get them on board this is super important and then she's going to have to to tread carefully though in, in some of these areas not to overplay it 
to annoy the other side because she still wants those independents in the middle and to take people from the GOP side if she can. And so that's where the Israel Gaza position we're going to talk about is very, very interesting. But here she just said, right, here are my receipts. That we must do. President Joe Biden and I promise to sign the PRO Act into law, and I promise you I will keep that promise. What I've done before, what I am going to do. So this is this is substance, right? So she's talked about a policy that they know about, and she said that, that will be signed, right? It's so not just vacuous claims about, yeah, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, whatever. You know, no detail. This is actual detail. Because when workers join together and demand what is fair, everyone is better off. Understand, and I, I say this everywhere I go, understand, you may not be a, a union member. And then this is important, right? Really important, because if you're listening to this as someone who's like, I don't care about unions, I, I even I don't like unions, I don't like collective bargaining. She's going to say, I'm speaking to you, you out there, you may not like this, but understand why it's important, which I think is really good. But you should thank unions, and I'm looking to the cameras in the back of the room. Not them, but the people who might be watching. Uh, you may not be a union member, but thank unions for the five-day work week. For the eight-hour work day. Thank unions for sick leave and paid family leave and vacation time. Because the fact is, unions helped build America's middle class. And when unions are strong, America is strong. So now she's talking, uh, well, she's linking unionization to the middle class, to patriotism and strong economic uh, performance. So the, all of these ideas are very well knitted together to if you're interested in patriotism, if you're interested in the economic success, if you're interested in, in if you're part of the American middle class. OK, this is important. And I, I, I used to have these. So I, I was in t two teachers unions, actually, over my time teaching. And we, which is when you're a teacher, you, it's just you have to be part of a union just for, for lots of practical reasons and safety reasons for your own um, you, you know, you can have like, uh, yeah, I don't want to go into details, but you really do need to be a member of the union. It's it's a very important safety net. Um, and she, uh, so she's sort of talking to all these ideas, connect, connecting them, and I, I, and then saying, and if you're not into unions, these are the the reasons why you should be thankful that unions exist. And I remember when when I when. Uh, you know, we I used to say go on strike a teacher strike because of X, Y, and Z, and people online would be like, "Oh, freaking unions!" And I'd be saying, "You do realise that these are all the things that unions have achieved?" And then exactly those kind of lists, like you know, um, paternity leave, maternity leave, five day working week, blah 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 blah, all these things that were that were achieved precisely because unions fought for them on behalf of everyone. So uh, I think that's a really interesting, strong position she's take, taken there on unions, as you would expect speaking to a union, right? But um, but it's clear that she's she's thinking a lot about who she's speaking to, where she's going to go, what the message is, and how she needs to get at this broad church of support across society um in in terms of you know getting enough votes from everyone right so then we're going to go and see what happened here so uh, netanyahu bb netanyahu the uh, the leader from the israeli leader who is in charge of a, a, an extremely right wing administration in israel who has reacted to some horrific things that, that took place with Hamas doing on October the 7th, some horrendous stuff, but then were very controversial, the Israeli regime in, in or administration in 
how they dealt with that. And then it turned into indiscriminate bombing, it appeared, of residential areas and the death of, of tens and tens of thousands of civilians, which is now pretty much accepted apart from by some people who want to deny that, that you know, over 30,000 civilians were killed and that was some time ago. And actually the stats are pretty much robustly supported now. So you have this situation where, like, it's complicated. And, and the problem is people either want to just full-on support Palestinians, that's not necessarily Hamas, right? Palestinian people, of which a certain amount of them are Hamas, who are terrorists and, and doing horrible things. But the civilians, you can say, oh, we don't want those children being killed, right? So, but, but it's like, we either support these guys or Israel. We're going to fully support these guys who have their own kind of sovereignty and nation state but have had a pretty poor track record with settling and and Gaza over time and then have reacted to a terrible thing with a terrible thing. But people are very binary and, and that is a problem. And the problem then is that people are particularly binary inside the Democrat Democratic Party rather than in the Republican Party. The Republican Party is far more overwhelmingly in support of Israel. And you heard that when and saw that when Bibi Netanyahu went to speak to Congress and half of the Democratic lawmakers were absent. So they boycotted it. So that already tells you that the party is split. And for everyone else that remained, he got an outrageously long um, of ovation before he even spoke. Right. Which is which tells you an awful lot. So this is an, an insanely divisive and div divisive topic with a divided nation. Now, when you are trying to take over the Democratic Party, but also trying to appeal to the nation to get as many votes as you can, this foreign policy nightmare is a potential landmine, right? And you could you could seriously come a cropper. So what she had to do, which is what I've been saying for a long time, which is actually my position, she's reflecting my position here, which is the only solution is something like a two state state solution or one state solution, but it's you've got two bunches of people that are living there that need to somehow live in harmony together. And if if one side is saying we cannot live in harmony, then you either have to kill the other side entirely or force um, expel them. And you have that this is like a massively bad situation. So the. the in order for there to be a resolution here, people have to be able to get on, and uh, and that requires essentially um, Israel not continuing to do what it's doing at the moment, which seems to be killing lots of people, but accepting that Israel has a right to sell to to exist as well as Palestinian people in in whatever way they feel they have a right to exist in you've got the same geographic area with two groups of people who just hugely disagree with each other. And so her position here, as you will hear, is the only, I think, um, the only path that she can possibly navigate right now. Uh, so let's, let's hear her. Well, I told him that I will always ensure that Israel is able to defend itself, including from Iran and Iran-backed militias such as... Sorry, so at the beginning, she is doing the right thing, which is to say Israel has every right to defend itself and Hamas did horrible things. And I don't deny they did horrible things and they kidnapped a bunch of people. Hamas and Hezbollah. From when I was a young girl collecting funds to plant trees for Israel to my time in the United States Senate and now at the White House, I have had an unwavering commitment to the existence of the state of Israel to its security, and to the people of Israel. I've said it many times, but it bears repeating. Israel has a right to defend itself, and how it does so matters. So then, now we go for the nuance. And this is where she's slightly differentiating herself from Biden. Biden was no fan of Netanyahu, but I think felt completely constrained by the the d division in his own party and also the division in Congress and the division in the nation as a whole. So a he found it very difficult to um, to navigate that. 
Harris gets a chance to start again and to put a layer stall out straight away, which she's doing. And she, she is expressing that nuance to try and appeal to both sides. Now, it remains to be seen whether she can appeal to both sides. But I think this is the only option she could take, which is say, you have a right to defend yourself, but actually how you defend yourself does matter. You can't just bomb the crap out of a bunch of civilians and say, well, yeah, there was a couple of Hamas people there and like killed 10,000 people. Do you know, I, I might be over exaggerating, but you get the point. So, she, so she's saying, you know, you need to be a bit, bit careful there. Hamas is a brutal terrorist organization. On October 7, Hamas triggered this war when it massacred 1,200 innocent people, including 44 Americans. Hamas has committed horrific acts of sexual violence and took 250 hostages. There are American citizens who remain captive in Gaza. Sagi. So she then goes and lists them, lists them all, all the American uh, hostages in Gaza. Now, this is to say that this is Hamas started this war, although, you know, it's ignoring the whole history there. But this this iteration, Hamas started this. They did terrible things. So, like, we all agree this, right? You can see that I am being hard on Hamas. Hamas are not the good guys. I'm not being a pro-Hamas, American flag-burning person here of the far left, right? She's, she's saying Hamas are at fault. However, and then I'm just forwarding on after she's mentioned all the people's names. Mayor Weinstein, God I have met with the families of these American hostages multiple times now. And by the way, that's powerful. So she's saying, I've met with all these families. Donald Trump would have not have done that. He probably couldn't have done that. But it's to say that, do you know what? I've also got some receipts of how I have been working to try and get these people back. And that, that I have, you know, I've met with each of them multiple times. And I've told them each time they are not alone and I stand with them. And President Biden and I are working every day to bring them home. I also expressed with the Prime Minister my serious concern about the scale of human suffering in Gaza. And here it comes. And then I spoke to him about how much his approach sucked. So what she's done is she's appealed to the people who are pro-Israel and said, I'm with you, I want these, these hostages back. Hamas has done terrible things. However... Israel have sucked in some of the ways that they have comported themselves. Including the death of far too many innocent civilians. And I made clear my serious concern about the dire humanitarian situation there. With over two million people facing high levels of food insecurity. And half a million people facing catastrophic levels of acute food insecurity. What has happened in Gaza over the past nine months is devastating. The images of dead children and desperate, hungry people fleeing. So now she is trying to play an emotive note, and rightly so. It is incredibly emotive what's happened, and some of those images are horrific. Now she's appealing to those people who might be protesting outside to say, outside Congress when Netanyahu was there, to say, look, I understand the horrors that you guys are concerned about. And so therefore, I, I will do everything I can to bring an end to this conflict in any way that as a head of state, an American head of state, I can. Now, what will be interesting to see what they do with, with regard to military aid and whether there'll be a slight change of stance there from Biden to Harris. Uh, Biden already had put certain conditioning, I think, on the aid and so on and so forth. There are these connections to Israel, of course, that, that are very difficult to untangle. But I just think that this is this is the right approach on a very, very difficult uh, subject. Um, Harris says she will not be silent about humanitarian toll in Gaza, says this NPR um, article, which kind of goes through how it, it was, you know, a... Um, uh, you know, a, a, this is a slightly different approach f for for Harris from Biden, and certainly I would assume from any Republican um, approach. And I think, like for those in the middle, this might appeal, which is we understand that that there is there are horrors going on. We support Israel's right to defend itself, but do you know what, guys? Just chill out a little bit on bombing the crap out of buildings. 
uh, you know, civilian buildings. Yes, I know they have tunnels, and yes, I know hiding behind civilians. But still, you know, just just killing all those bits. Is, is there not any other way? Can we can we work through this, you know, in a slightly better way? So, uh, I, and I don't want an argument with you guys about the Israel conflict. What I'm trying to express is that how difficult it is when your own party is divided, and when the electorate is in possibly a different place than the Democratic Party, but you need some of that electorate on side. So, yeah, I, I think I think she did as well as she possibly could there, interestingly. But let me know what you think. And obviously, I'm not playing it all to you. Uh, uh, Donald Trump Jr. tanking his dad's campaign with one of the worst Veep choices of all time is delicious. So the, these uh, this idea that Donald Trump Jr., um, Elon Musk and Tucker Carlson were the people behind J.D. Vance getting the nom nomination for or getting the, to be the VP choice for Trump is possibly coming back to bite him. And this is growing in um, growing in increased problem ness. It is problematic for the Republicans. So you look at Quayle in 1988, plus 15, even Sarah Palin, plus 26. J.D. Vance, minus five in uh, favorability ratings. So when we go back to here, the, the live update, one of the things that was quite interesting um, is the uh, is that apparently some Republicans are criticizing the J.D. Vance selection. So according to The Hill, veteran lawmakers, moderates and Reagan style conservatives have anonymously spoken out about their disapproval towards Vance. Quote, he was one of the worst choices of all the options. It was so bad that I didn't even think it was possible. Anti-Ukraine, more of a populist. He adds nothing to the Trump ticket. He energizes the same people that love Trump, said one House Republican. It, I think if you were to ask as many people around a building, nine out of ten on our side would say he was the wrong pick, another House Republican said, adding, he's the only person who can do serious damage. The prevailing sentiment is if Trump loses, it's because of this pick. It doesn't help, said another House Republican. And that's going to be fascinating. I think tr if Trump does lose this election, J.D. Vance will be the fall guy. He will be absolutely eviscerated by uh, Trump and uh, and other Republicans, and possibly for good reason as well. I, I think this was, as I've said multiple times now, absolutely the wrong strategic pick. He doesn't add anything. In fact, he takes away. Uh, so he's taken away from, he keeps doubling down on this kind of childless cat cat lady approach uh, of, of not endearing the GOP to women. Um, and he also you know, said uh, that... Um, Harris should be grateful to America as if, you know, that's a bit of a dog whistle thing to say. And then we have this. Now, I sort of played you this. I don't know. It's a breaking, a stunning leak, actually. This has been around and I played part of this to you yesterday. But let's, I didn't play you. I don't think I played you this excerpt. Uh, J.D. Vance is found to be calling on a federal response to stop women from traveling from red states to blue states to receive reproductive health care. Retweets all Americans hear this devastating leak. So the idea is that he advocates stop a, a, a national like a federal um constraint on women traveling from state to state so you on the one hand you've got trump saying hey i'm not anti-abortion i'm just putting it down to the states this old deflection thing where i've overturned roe v wade which meant meant that the the declaration that you can have you have a right to abortion is enshrined in kind of federal law and he undid Roe v Wade or the, the Supreme Court undid Roe v Wade on his beckoning and through his um, stacking the Supreme Court you then had this going down to state level and as soon as it went down to state level you had something like 15 states already had legislation stacked up ready to go at that moment that, that meant that abortion was suddenly illegal so then you had a load of states saying it's illegal now what would then happen is that if you're saying well it's a state's right to choose then you should be saying well Therefore, since you have a freedom of movement around the country, right, you can't stop people going over state lines. Well, if you if it's illegal to get this procedure done in this state, well, then they go to a state where it is legal. And now you've got J.D. Vance saying that should be in itself illegal. So you shouldn't be able to leave states, which means that it kind of plays around with this idea that you've given the um, the rights to the states. But you're then saying 
but there will be some federal oversight oversight to to stop people moving um, to get that. I, I mean, I could play it to you. I'm not going to play it to you. Actually, save time. But you get the idea. That's what he's saying. Now, this is going to be super super unpopular because, as we know now, that actually the majority of men and women in America are pro-choice, and so that's why when you have a party that listens to a subset of that party for their views on something and then you try and run on those views and they're not popular across the whole nation you're in some trouble you could say we've just been talking about that with regard to palestine and israel it might be that and that's why it's so difficult because if kamala, kamala harris said we're going to go down a totally pro-palestine route because there are some people in my party that shout loudly about that then actually the broad swathe of um of American society won't take that on board. So she's got to she's got to navigate a, a tough path there. Well, the same can be said about um, abortion and reproductive rights and IVF and, and whatnot. That this is a very divisive subject, but actually only a minority of the GOP or of the electorate as a whole um, support really strict pro-life positioning. And most people are at least cool with certain types of abortion, especially for like rape and incest, where J.D. Vance is like, no. So he's like super strong. And if you then on on, on that and then on Roe v. Wade uh, ramifications, then if you're going to try and campaign on that, you're going to lose a centre again. It's only it only matters about what the people in the middle think at the moment. So that that's that's really important. Now, um, as the independent here says, let's look at some of the polls. So um, she's been in, endorsed by Barack Obama. Then there are some more polls coming out to show that she is bouncing in the polls. Uh, a new New York Times Siena College uh, poll has found that she's only one percentage point behind Trump. And that's a narrowing of the six point gap that Joe Biden had. So there is a five point swing there which is really important because she hasn't even started campaigning. Those questions would have been asked a couple of days ago when she's just been announced. And so you are seeing more and more polls suggesting that it's going to be a very close race at the very least for Harris. Like, as it stands, unless it's a complete disaster for her, she's really challenging uh, Trump in the polls. So here we go. 48 to 46 in the registered voters, but the likely voters is more important. So these are people that you look at their track record and they, they are they are people that do go and vote rather than people who are registered. But actually, just because you're registered doesn't mean you're going to vote. Um, so you have three different levels. You have anyone who can vote. You have like a national poll of people just, yeah, yeah, I'd vote for Trump. Yeah, but actually, have you ever voted for? No, I don't usually vote, but I would vote for Trump. OK, so you get everyone in, in the larger pool, then that goes down to registered votes. So so some of these people might not be registered. I'd vote for Trump. Are you registered? No, I'm not registered. I'm literally not registered, but you, I would vote for Trump. Yep, so tick for Trump. OK, then it goes down to a smaller, a smaller pool, which is registered voters. Yeah, I'm a registered Democrat. I'd vote for Harris. Um, yeah, but are you likely to vote? No, probably not, actually. So I don't usually bother, but I am registered. And then you get down to likely voters like, oh, yeah, I'd vote for Trump. And do you normally vote? I vote every bleeding time. And it means an awful lot to me. And I am going to get out there. So the likely voters is your most accurate uh, polling pool, if you like. Most predictive, if you like, of, of what will happen. And then then really you want to look at state by state because actually it's only certain states that really matter. So even a likely voter poll won't tell you, won't give you a great indication of who will win the election because it depends where those people are. So if you're taking a broad selection of people across the states and yet, you know, there are certain either really highly populated states that, that, or low populated, you know, different weighting, but these battleground states are, are the more important, and it, it is those are the places that you want to find out what people are thinking. Then it skews how even a likely voter poll can be, skews its predictiveness, or anyway. So the point is that, that she is improving in the polls. Now, here's the issue. Oh, no, let's do, do a little bit more on polling before we have that, but hang on. GOP are going to be fighting and they're going to be fighting right now. Um, these key state, these battleground state polls are, if anything, more encouraging than the national polls. Because, as you say, these are where these half a dozen states will say where, where the election is going to be won and lost. And there's been more noticeable movement 
in some of these some of these states towards Harris than you see in the the national polls at this very very early stage since the the switchover the handing on of the of the baton uh, a loop. look at Arizona but well, it's a two point shift in in Harris's direction since then but other states Pennsylvania well now it's gone from being well Trump's now got a two point lead he had a five point lead before five that and, and these are states where you could see the vice president being chosen from which in these key states which are going to provide the key electoral college votes that could be the stuff this is going to be the stuff that tips it over the edge well absolutely uh, and you know some of the shifts look small but every vote counts as we saw at the last election and you know and in georgia going from trump leading by six to just leading by two wisconsin really interesting trump was leading by four before biden dropped out that's now a tie so there has been a definite shift in these states and as you say in places like pennsylvania michigan that's where they're talking about some of the potential vice presidential candidates coming from and yeah, you know, often they don't make a huge difference but in a swing state where you could be talking about you know thousands rather than hundreds of thousands uh, of votes that could make a difference so you know I think we need to shift how we categorize this presidential race from a sort of likely or lean Trump to a pure toss-up at this stage based on yeah. the polling we're seeing it will be more interesting to see what happens next week. Um, there's been some indication that these comments from J.D. Vance, the vice presidential candidate, um, about uh, Kamala not being a mother will have landed badly with some uh, groups, unsurprisingly. It'll be interesting to see if that has an impact on the polling. Yeah, uh, And interesting there. So I'm just actually, just to give you an indication, just found this poll while he was speaking. Um and here, this is from 23 hours ago, but this is since Biden dropped out. So you've got in Wisconsin, a new Emerson College poll has found Harris and Trump 47 apiece. So 47, 47. This is important because earlier this month, Trump was up 48, 43. So there's been a, a leveling up there already. So that's from five points to zero. So it's a five point swing. Um, a poll ha also has Trump leading Harris in five out of six battleground states. So, but the question is, have they closed up? And that is what you guys just then were saying that yes, they have closed up, which is super, super important. Um, so interesting to see how those polls go. Now, we're going to listen to James Carville, so old school Democratic. Um, he's, where is he from? He's not Alabama. He's Louisiana, isn't he? Uh, same state as Mike Johnson. I mean, he absolutely hates Mike Johnson. But anyway, James Carville is all, always good value to listen to. Uh, here he is talking about, hey, guys, just stop getting too positive here. There, you, You're going to come across some pretty hard times. I look at the coverage and it's great. And we're just, well, let me, if I had to write a play about what I think it's going to be like, it would be entitled The Ice Pick Cometh. Okay? Get ready. They're coming. All right, and it's good. Everybody should feel good and liberated and, and everything else. But if we don't win the election, we hadn't done anything. We haven't changed the temperature in America. We haven't changed anything. And I think the vice president, I hope that, you know, her campaign is getting ready. Uh, I hope they listen to my friend and fellow New Orleanian, Don Brazil, who, has, who actually, I think, has the same kind of view of politics that I do. And they're coming at us. And they're going to keep coming. And this kind of giddy elation is not going to be very helpful much longer because that's not what we're going to be faced with. And I think... So I think confirmation is from Louisiana. He's wearing a Louisiana top. So this is like the Republicans are going to be coming at... And in fact, they already are going hard at the Democrats. They have, they have got a load of campaign ads on TVs where the... Democrats haven't been spending because of all the chaos. Uh, Democrats got a lot, lot of money to spend, but at the moment, the advantage is in the Republicans' court. Although you might say 100 days is a long time, right? And, you you know, are they going to spank out their, um, their, their spending too early? I think the vice president, put it in athletic terms, needs a really good cut man in a corner because she's getting ready to get cut. Hmm. That's the bite. Let me show you the polling. Way, but no, hey, that, we, we welcome all uh, we welcome mm -hmm. all views, all points, and I know you're a <laughs> practitioner of the game, so you know when the game has 15 weeks, 100 days left, and what you're up against, yeah. you don't want too much celebrating mm -hmm. uh, to, to extend your sports analogies. You don't want to celebrate before you're in the end zone. I think people get that even if they are 
uh, feeling very different than they right. did last week. Um, very okay, early, Francesca is absolutely... Well, go ahead, and then I'll show you the polls. Go ahead. No, 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 I was finished. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, well, Francesca's right. It's very early to judge any polling because it's all new information. It's all going to take a while to shake out. Um, but to the extent that we learn anything from these state polls, um, she's already doing better than Biden was if they're both somewhat known quantities. Uh, Trump's margin here pretty tight in states like Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, pretty much tied in Wisconsin. Harris improving uh, on Biden's standing by a, a nudge there. Depends on the state. Uh, and again, I want to tell uh, viewers, as I always do, these are within the margin of error. That means that if you're plus or minus one or two there, it's, it's well, it's plus or minus 3.4 in the margin. So it's, statistically speaking, tied. Um, but I'll go on those polls out to James and then Francesca. So, yeah, good, the polls are looking good. But, you know, it is early days and the Republicans are going to go hard, right? And indeed, if you're going to look at Fox News here, Republicans dominate the airwaves as Harris seeks to come back in the polls, but Dems aren't worried, which is the idea that actually they... So the Associated Press reports that former President Trump and his allies are outspending Harris's campaign 25 to 1. I mean, that is phenomenal, right? On TV and radio advertising. And that's what you'd expect because there will be adverts that are still up that, that are probably good to go against Harris anyway that they're probably generic adverts against the 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 um democrats or localized against local senators and and um representatives and whatnot and Harris won't have made adverts yet, right? So th th this is not surprising. But what you don't want to do, a lot of analysts have talked about this, what you don't want to allow the Republicans to do is paint um, Harris's identity, is get to define who she is before she gets to define who she is. So if you get the adverts out first and then you control who people think Harris is and then she's always fighting back against that caricature of who she is rather than her getting her adverts out first and saying this is who I am and then the, the Republicans having to fight against that kind of identification that that labeling or that narrative so there's a there will be a battle to as to who gets to to you know plant their roots down first as to who Kamala Harris is and if she doesn't spend some money right now, very quickly, she could cede that to, to the Republicans and that could give them a really significant advantage that lasts until the election. Um, and, you know, the Democrats might then be fighting fire the whole time. The Republicans have spent more than $68 million compared to $2.6 million by the Democrats since Monday, according to the media tracking firm Ad Impact. The top topics include the ongoing border crisis and inflation and as well as her record that critics have presented as extremely left wing. So this is what you're going to see. And you have heard already. Um, it's, it's really funny because gone are the days of this being a, a, you know, Trump being a unifier, right? Trump's assassination attempt and him saying, oh, this horrible rhetoric. He's now gone back to exactly that rhetoric. So he's uh, trying to get he hasn't found quite yet a uh, an insult for her a nickname for her that sticks. He tried lying Kamala, but it doesn't really work. And he knows that he can't choose a, a nickname that is too dog whistly like, to do with race or maybe to do with her her being a woman because that will not play well so he's got to be careful and of course something like lying when he lies he, he's just full of projection but he hasn't quite quite found one that sticks but they, they are already hitting hard on immigration they are going to be campaigning on immigration on the economy even though the economy is good and actually the the stats have come out again today this morning in fact there is um, uh, there's a bit of a video I'll probably show you, but the stats have come out this morning to show the economy is good, but there's this perception difference between um, inflation and, I won't show it to you because it just says what I'm saying, there's this perception difference between inflation and reality that I talked about yesterday, but they are going to be going on that, so the economy, immigration, and then her record as being a prosecutor, but they will claim that she was a really liberal prosecutor and didn't put enough people away. And so even though she's going to go strong on prosecutor versus perpetrator, prosecutor versus per, prosecutor versus felon, they will try and hit back that say she was just too liberal, blah, blah, blah. And that she is like the most left wing. Like Trump has already said she's the most left wing X, Y, and Z ever. 
um, and that's the way they're going to go. So it, this this honeymoon says, meanwhile, Harris has earned a flood of media coverage since Biden announced Sunday that he would not stand for re-election and endorsed Harris as his successor. Trump campaign has dubbed it a Harris honeymoon and predicted a polling boost for the former California senator. So they have said, it, yeah, the, they've conceded the Republicans that there will be a boost, uh, a, a bounce in her polls, but that, you know, things things will change as and they get their attack ads out um we're working to get up ads as quickly as we can though it's only been three days and in the meantime she's dominating earned media a campaign official told politico um i think it's light lighting your money on fire to do ads when you're getting the best and most earned media of the cycle clinton veteran nick merrill told the outlet in other words that actually there's no point spending so the the flip side for from the democrat point of view is there's no point spending money on advertising when we're getting free advertising through all this media coverage all the social media sharing and the, and the news cycles that are just carrying more and more of Harris being successful and people being excited that actually that saves you money and spends your money slightly later in the campaign you know when when that all wears off and by slightly later, I mean like next week. <laughs> but there you go. So they, they, they expect the Republican machine to just really kick in. And as this meme suggests, you'll have Russians uh, supporting the the Republican campaigning as well. The idea that you're going to have loads of Russian troll farms operating with people saying, I'm a black American female who would never vote for Kamala Harris. The typical kind of introduce your identity, then speak your position and pretend you're someone you're not. Typical troll behavior. So there will be an awful lot of that. Just got to watch the disinformation that's going to be absolutely flooding uh, the the um, social media airwaves if you like anyway that's enough from me today so interesting movements here and there polls are gonna i think look better and as your british guy there said it's gonna be interesting to see what the polls do in reaction to jd vance and the problematic approach that he has had and you've got this this unease in the republican camp with that jd vance is not the right pick and that's brilliant and and you know what so whenever you're campaigning you find a crack and you drive a wedge into it and that's the wedge that the democrats are going to be thinking we have to we have to capitalize on that jd vance is a weak the weak point here if we tell everyone what his views are on abortion and on x y and z and cat ladies that is just perfect he's given this ammunition to the to the democrats uh, and likewise the democrats are going to be uh, so republicans are going to be looking at kamala harris's weak spots and you know waiting for the vp but but the thing about the vp and it's something i didn't quite say yesterday so if you look to all of the vp picks for ha harris whether it be mark kelly josh shapiro um andy Bashir. Uh, these are all really strong people. There's not one of those you go, oh, it'd be disastrous if they put him in. Or, assuming it's going to be a male, which I think it is. Uh, but even if it was Gretchen Whitmer, you know, these are all really strong people that, that each have their own benefits. When it comes to the Republicans, they've chosen an absolute douche who is just the wrong pick. And so the, the Democrats are in a really lucky position there. They have a lot of strong younger people coming through who are very good politicians who can carry um, a VP pick easily. And and I think there is a really great advantage that means that they can just hammer that wedge between J.D. Vance and uh, Trump. And actually, the last thing I'm going to say, part of the problem with J.D. Vance is he's got his own sense of a trajectory to being this this great powerful person he would sell himself for the power the problem is with trump if you outshine trump like trump picked um, mike pence precisely because mike pence wouldn't outshine him he's dull as dishwater but he got the evangelical christians on his side so they've got tr they've got jd vance who was hoping for, for you know your project 2025 christian all that kind of stuff but he's also trying to be a bit more 
than what Trump would like him to be. When when J.D. Vance was making a speech at the RNC convention, Trump was very uncomfortable because he didn't spend enough time saying how wonderful Trump was in his speech. He spent a minute or so doing that, 30 seconds doing that, and then everything was about J.D. Vance. Whereas Trump... So the interesting reflection on the RNC is that was the first convention where like the, the presidential nominee has sat through and watched pretty much everyone. And he was watching people. And usually you'd have all these speeches and then, you know, if it had been Reagan or whoever, they would have been faffing off doing something else and then coming back to see the odd one. Trump sat through because he wanted to see how much people were just showering appreciation on him. He's so narcissistic that the whole thing was just a, a narcissus looking into that pool and, and seeing a reflection back and saying how wonderful that was. Right. So when J.D. Vance then stood up and only gave him a little bit of that and the rest was about how wonderful J.D. Vance was, that didn't sit well with Trump and that's apparently why he was well could be why he was a bit angry afterwards and not too happy with the choice and you've got a dynamic there that isn't what Trump would like whereas when you get you know this is why people are like where's where has Kamala Harris been on the campaign trail oh sorry on why she's been vice president why has she been so quiet and there's an argument to say she's been purposefully quiet because the role of the vice president is not to outshine the president. And when the president was old and getting older, as everyone does, but in, in you know, getting weaker and weaker, the, the stronger that the vice president seems, the more problematic that is in a relationship dynamics. And so Harris would have been outshining Biden quite easily, probably, if she had been more out there. So there's an argument that she was being sidelined or sidelined herself precisely because the relationship between vice president and president should be one of, um, you know, submission almost to the greater figure there that you want to play second fiddle, but a very distant second fiddle. Um, and that doesn't appear to be Vance's positioning, at least initially. He might be put in his place now. Anyway, I just thought I'd add that one in. Thanks for watching. Take care, guys, and speak to you soon. Hopefully this is of um, interest to you.